Is there anyone that has ever lived on our world or our planet who has been able to tell us why the planet was created in the first place and therefore why we were created and therefore what the meaning of life is? What we have been sharing on this broadcast at this time is that uh, there is such a being. And he uh, did come to this earth and did uh, appear to come from outer space and did have the ability to leave this earth and to come back again. And that's something, of course, that none of the great religious leaders like Muhammad and Buddha and Zoroaster and Confucius have ever done. All of them have been ordinary human beings like you and me, died like dogs, were buried and forgotten, at least as far as their grave is concerned. But this being that came to earth and had the ability to leave it and come back again seemed to have a connection with the supreme being behind the universe that uh, is different qualitatively from any relationship that any of the other religious leaders talk about as having to that supreme being. And this, of course, was the man that is known by probably all of us as Jesus. And he lived, actually, in the first century of our era. If you're like me, your attitude to it is great skepticism. And you think to yourself, oh, now, wait a minute, don't give me that stuff. That I threw out when I left Sunday school. That I threw out when I gave up church. Don't give me that about Jesus of Nazareth as if he's some real person. I know he's just a mythological figure that we use to have a good time at Christmas about. That's not uh, sensible. I want to know about the meaning of life in a realistic way that will help me, that will be of some relevance and use to my life. So don't talk to me about this Jesus of Nazareth. He's just a mythological figure, far from being a mythological figure. He is one whose historicity is more reliable than any other human being that we have reco records of at that time. And if you say, well, now why? Why do you say that? I say it because the men that wrote about him in the book that we have, of course, come to regard just as a religious book, but is actually a very reliable history book. It's the Bible, and the last quarter particularly of it, the New Testament, is the one that uh, talks about the first century when he lived. Uh, the Bible talks about him as a real historical figure. And, of course, many of us say, oh, well, now, the men that wrote that book, they weren't reliable. I mean, they just made it up years and years after the event. No, they didn't. They were eyewitnesses of the event. They said that. Peter, in a letter that he wrote to some of his friends, said, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, because we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were actually with him when the voice came on the mountain and said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And that's what Peter said in his second letter. It's called Second Epistle of Peter, and chapter 1 and verse 16. And he said that. Now, some of us say, of course, well, that's just him saying it. Is there evidence that he actually was alive at that time? Yes. There are many references to Peter in other history books that were written outside the Bible. And indeed, what we quoted yesterday was some of the Roman historians like Tacitus and Tertullian, who made reference to Jesus of Nazareth in their own history books. But you may say, well, yes, but the main evidence we have about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, is from these so-called eyewitnesses who, you say, wrote this account in the New Testament that is reliable history. Now, really, why should you believe these men? Well, there are several very good reasons. One, of course, is the very obvious fact that uh, they circulated their accounts all round the then known world, while hundreds of people were alive who had actually observed the very events that they recorded. In other words, uh, there is a, a letter that one of them called Paul wrote to a place called Galatia, where there was a little group of people who believed that this man Jesus was really connected with the supreme being behind the universe. And in that book that was written in 48 AD, this man called Paul 
referred to the crucifixion of this man, Jesus, and to him rising from the dead. Now, do you see that there were many people alive in 48 AD? Because after all, Jesus was crucified in 29 AD. So this was only a matter of 19 years later. There were many people alive at that time who, when they saw Paul's account being circulated, all they had to do was contradict it. All they had to do was say, that wasn't so at all. I was in Jerusalem at that time. It didn't happen at all that way. He didn't rise from the dead. But in fact, there was no outcry like that. There was just no outcry of contradiction in the ancient world of the first century when all these accounts were being circulated. So between 48 AD and probably 90 to 100 AD, all the books that make up our New Testament were circulating and being read by eyewitnesses, people who believed and people who didn't believe, but many of whom were in Jerusalem. For instance, if a young man was 20 years of age when Jesus was crucified at 29, then 20 years later he was only 49. And so he was a relatively young man, certainly a man in middle age, and there must have been many such alive at that time. And all they had to do was say, no, it didn't happen this way. And that would have immediately destroyed the popularity of the accounts that were circulating that eventually became our New Testament. So one of the big, in fact unanswerable, reasons for believing that what we have in what we call the New Testament is reliable history is that the accounts of that history were circulating at a time when many, many hundreds of people were still alive who had been eyewitnesses of the actual crucifixion and the resurrection. And all they had to do was contradict it, and that would have sunk any continued existence of those books. It would be a bit like somebody trying to write a book today about John F. Kennedy and uh, trying to suggest that uh, he had been shot by uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Well, there are plenty of us who were alive at that time. That's 1963. That's actually 22 years ago. It's longer ago than uh, the crucifixion of Jesus was compared with the book of Galatians. And all we have to do is say, no, it wasn't so at all. I saw it. I was there. There was a friend of mine in Dallas. It didn't happen that way at all. And that would immediately kill that account as far as being a historical record is concerned. And so it is with the records of this man's life in the first century. There were many people alive who read the accounts, and far from contradicting them, they actually reinforced them. In fact, the only records we have is of the lies that people like the Romans and the Jewish people created in order to explain away the apparently miraculous resurrection of this man Jesus. But there are other reasons too. I mean, these men who wrote these books uh, that are known as the New Testament have not made an impression on subsequent history as being pirates, criminals, con men. They haven't. Wherever their influence has been felt, there has been a respect for honesty, a respect for integrity. It has had an elevating effect on mankind. So these men do not come across as parrots and liars. They come up across as true and honest men. And of course, the last and the greatest reason is they died for the things they wrote. They died for the very things that they wrote. Now, men may die for something that they think is true, but they will not die for something that they know is untrue. And so there is an ethical and logical and philosophical impossibility in believing that these men invented what they wrote. These men of all men must have really observed this man that came from outer space and lived in the first century of our era and said that he had a unique relationship to the supreme being behind the universe.